I'm Wes Perry, CEO of Alpha Architect, and today we're going to talk about a very important topic of factor investing. And the title of this talk is Factor Investing is Simple but Not Easy. And really what one could do is put active investing in place of factor investing, because really this is a framework piece that's really just trying to help us better understand how to make good decisions when we do something different than a passive global market portfolio. So the general organization here is we're going to first just explain what is factor investing. A lot of people are unfamiliar with the term and there's a lot of confusion out there. Uh, and then we're going to talk about do factors work and more importantly, why do they work? Uh, things to consider when deploying factors. And then finally, probably the most important part about factor investing or frankly, any sort of active investing is understanding how we're going to manage investor behavior. Because if we match a reasonable strategy or process with bad client behavior, we end up with a lose-lose situation. So first off, what is factor investing? Easiest way to explain this for people is it's essentially money ball for finance, where we have this theory in finance that expected returns are going to simply come from two buckets. Uh, or potentially only one, depending on which camp you're from. There's essentially a risk bucket. So you're going to get extra return because you take on more risk. And there's a mispricing bucket. So you could get extra return or you could get less return, depending on what valuation you purchase a given asset at. So where does factor investing come in? Well, essentially what we're going to do is we're going to look at characteristics of securities to help us predict future expected returns. And ideally, we can map these characteristics to the elements of risk and mispricing. For example, we might use price to earnings or a basic valuation metric as a way to predict expected returns. So for example, we could take a thousand securities, sort them on deciles based on price to earnings. So cheap would be the top decile, cheapest securities based on price to earnings. Uh, and similarly, decile 10 would be the most expensive securities based on price to earnings. And then we could do a bunch of analysis and identify that the long-term expected return on this cheap decile is very high and the long-term performance on this very expensive decile is very low. And then ideally what we could then do is map back this price to earnings proxy to additional risk and potentially mispricing. Because then we would have confidence that this price to earnings characteristics is proxying for fundamental risk and potentially mispricing, which would then give us confidence that it makes sense that that's why price to earnings predicts expected return. That's, a, that's an applied example, but the bottom line is it's money ball for finance. Whereas in money ball, they would look at a baseball player's different statistics in order to predict their future performance. Factor investing is essentially looking at stocks as baseball players, and we're going to look at their different characteristics on these stocks and how that might map to future expected returns. To clarify up front, factor investing is definitely not magic. It's not necessarily low risk investing. It could be very high risk. It's not necessarily high return. It could be very low return. And it's not necessarily black box. We don't have to have a bunch of quant PhDs in the back room smoking cigars, you know, burning up their computer servers. It can be highly, highly transparent. And finally, it's not necessarily passive investing. Factor investing, although it's done with a computer, is very active in the sense where we define active as being different than just holding the market portfolio. Factor investing is very active in many respects. And then finally, it's not necessarily innovative. Factor investing and the, or the idea of using characteristics to predict future returns has been around for 100 years, um, maybe longer. Uh, you know, look to Ben Graham. He's talked about low PE strategies forever. We're going to be very careful with is understanding that this is not new and it is not magical. It is not really that much different than stock picking, where stock pickers often try to map characteristics or elements of their process to future performance. All that factor investing is doing 
is doing this in a much more rigorous, systematic way. But inherently, there's not a lot of difference between factor investing or what traditional stock takers are actually doing. One of the things we want to be careful with is that factor investing is often sold as a beat the market strategy without giving investors context of why it beats the market. So we'll often be shown a chart, whereas here the blue line is the quote unquote proprietary value algorithm and the green line is the S&P. And this is an investor growth chart that's plotted over the past uh, almost 100 years. And the proprietary value algorithm is not very proprietary at all. It's simply owning the top decile, cheapest securities based on price to book. But we could call it proprietary to make people think that we're being fancy. And so what we'll see is this chart that highlights like, wow, I'd rather be up in this corner as opposed to down here with those quote unquote losers in the S&P. Um, so that's how this is sold as if we're going to you know, beat the market and it's going to be easy. Uh, but what I like to tell people is that's not reality. The reality of factor investing or, or frankly active investing, anything that's going to quote unquote beat the market over time is the formula is no pain, no gain. So you will always go through situations where people question why you're doing what you're doing. You know, the model doesn't work. Value is dead. We need better technologies. It's, it's a tech stock market. Uh, the profit margin doesn't matter. Profits don't margin. You know, all the traditional things that we've heard over the years in the different uh, sentiment driven marketplaces, these are all things that create pain and anguish for those who are disciplined and stick to a process, uh, which is essentially the essence of what factor investing is trying to accomplish. So a natural question is, well, okay, great. You know, do these things work? Um, so what we have here is just simple charts that highlight that yes, historically, generic factors have worked. So on this left hand side of the slide here is just over the past 50, 60 years, the concept of buying cheap. So if we simply buy the top decile cheapest stocks on book to market, this black line, it crushes this blue line, which is the generic S&P 500. Uh, we've even taken out some costs here to make it more realistic. And then shifting over here to the right, momentum or relative strength is simply this concept of buy winners or buy strong. If we've done this strategy over the last 50, 60 years, it absolutely crushes the S&P 500. So there is no doubt that historically, simple things like buying cheap and buying strong have remarkable resilience. And now people have gone back 200 years in different countries, different examples, and highlighted this general point that these things seem to work, at least historically. Now, a common refrain and complaint about factors is, a, well, that's great. That was all historical. They don't work anymore. And here's why. In the old days, you had these maniac gunslinging stock pickers. Uh, humans weren't that smart back then. They were totally driven by emotion. You know, they didn't have computers. They weren't the math PhDs. They weren't the Jane Simons of uh, the world at Rentech who make money uh, faster than they can think about it. So competition has simply killed investing. And this is a common meme and theory that we hear out there that because of computational power, because of data availability, because of transactions cost uh, lowering, uh, essentially all factors no longer work um, because you know anyone can do them now. And there's a problem though. This is a correlation argument, but it doesn't really get to the cause. Because if we look here on this chart, this is a chart where the line right here on the x-axis is time, and the y-axis is the five-year relative performance to the S&P 500. So for example, right here at this point, this was a five-year period where generic value beat the S&P 500 by 30% per year compounded over that five-year period. So obviously you're very happy to be a value investor at this point. Uh, but we can also look here and it looks around about 1970. There's a five-year period where generic value 
underperformed by almost 10% per year relative to the S&P 500. And blue line represents the momentum strategy. Um, so again, if you look here in recent memory, it is certainly the case that value and momentum have not been huge winners, right? And the argument is that, well, all these machine learning people came in. Problem with that argument is that historically, we've seen long-term relative performance drags in many, many situations. This is only over the past 100 some odd years. We also have data now with the prior 100 years, and it shows the exact same phenomenon. There's something baked in the cake here where we know that factors like value and momentum work, quote unquote, over the long haul, but the transition of getting to the long haul is extremely painful. And it's not necessarily the case that just because people are smarter, have more data, have more access, that it's that these factors are going to be vanquished. And we'll talk about why. And that's very important because before we can make a correlation argument, we need to make a causation argument. Why does any strategy make money in the first place? And this is a fundamental question that we would want to understand as an investor in, frankly, any asset. They just look at past performance. They look at what the salesman is telling them, and they just believe it. Um, but that's probably not a great way of placing our bets today into the future perspective. My kind of intro to this question uh, was when I was a, a University of Chicago PhD student. What I, I'd always been a traditional stock picker my whole life, very keen on value, as you know, value was the best thing going, huge Ben Graham, Warren Buffett fan, had done those investment philosophies for many years. And of course, when I get to the University of Chicago, I got to hang out with this fine gentleman here, Professor Eugene Fama who many of you probably know is now the Nobel Prize winner for this concept of the efficient market hypothesis. Essentially says that prices generally f reflect fundamentals at all points in time. You know, when I entered this program initially, uh, it's been a couple of years, and then I left uh, for a sabbatical for the military service, came back, and I, I was a little bit honored. So I was like, you know what, I'd like to prove this old guy wrong. So what I ended up doing, is I ended up reading almost 4,000 stock pitches on this organization called Value Investors Club, uh, uh, an organization I'd been part of for a long time. It had been founded by Joel Greenblatt, an investor whom I learned a lot from and really respected. And I was like, man, these stock pitches on this website are very compelling. These people, I'm pretty confident, beat the market because they always give me very compelling investor pitches. Long story short, I you know, read all these things, catalog and put them in a database, and I write in one chapter of my dissertation, value investors have stock picking skills. I submit it to Professor Fama, uh, get an immediate response. Well, your conclusion has to be false. A little bit disheartened to hear this, so I immediately respond back, go down to the office, Professor Fama, uh, what do we need to do here? We've been talking about this for a long time, I need to graduate from this place. Please tell me what the situation is. And he says, Wes, listen, you're making a macro conclusion. You cannot say based on your evidence that value investors have stock picking skills. You need to highlight that the sample of value investors that you analyze have stock picking skills. And so I stepped back and I said, okay, so we just need to change a few words here in the abstract and we're good. He's like, that's right. You know, words matter. Um, and you need to be precise. So, which was a good lesson, and I was very happy because I was able to graduate from this place. But more importantly, it made me step away and kind of recognize that, yes, market prices are pretty efficient, but they aren't always necessarily perfectly rational. There definitely does seem to be evidence that there's slack in asset prices. That was interesting, but then we need to juxtapose that evidence against something that we all know and well, at least or the recent memory here as of 2019, beating the market is almost impossible. So these are the stats for the last five years here where the number of funds that have beaten the S&P is not very good. So in general, these active managers are just getting pummeled for, versus this generic S&P 500 benchmark. What's going on? It, on one hand, we know that markets are not perfect, it, and it seems like that would mean there should be easy money out there because we've all met the, you know, our, our uncle George who's crazy and 
invest in the stock market based on what people are saying on CNBC. But then again, when we look to the evidence of professionals, there's very little evidence that it's easy to beat the market. In fact, it seems to be incredibly difficult to beat the market. We got to ask, do the Nobel Prize have the answer to this question? And so this is obviously a parody, but in 2013, you know, Professor Fama and Professor Schiller, as well as Lars Hansen, who's not pictured, um, won the Nobel Prize. Um, but the most compelling narrative is amongst these two gentlemen, where one is kind of the the archetype of the efficient market hypothesis, and the other essentially says that no, markets are pretty rational, people are nuts. Um, so the Nobel Committee kind of gave this Nobel Prize to people that have totally different opinions on how and why the stock market works. And here's a quick narrative of how they think about it. So Fama will say, well, markets are efficient. And Professor Schiller will say, eh, no, they're not because people are crazy. And we have plenty of evidence that that's the case. And he'll say, well, okay, great. You know, why can't anyone beat the market? And then Schiller will respond, well, because people are insane. So long story short, it doesn't seem like just because you have a Nobel Prize means you have the exact answer or solution to the world. Now, that said, I think the genius potentially of the Nobel Prize Committee is in awarding these gentlemen this prize because I think the answer on how to understand why assets earn what they earn probably can be resolved by both schools of thought. Where on one hand, there's the efficient market hypothesis that risk drive expected returns. So fundamental market risk, if you take more of those, you're going to earn higher expected returns. Makes sense. But then there's a behavioral camp, which says like things like limits of arbitrage and human psychology, the combination of these two elements can create also excess returns. But a lot of times it's very difficult to exploit these. And the, the one that I highlight here, because I think it's the most easy to understand for people, is that of career rates. So sometimes one may do a strategy to exploit mispricing, but it's not exactly easy because one can lose their job if they in, endure these uh, strategies. So long story short, kind of the secret formula to earning expected excess returns is essentially no pain, no gain. And now what we'll do is we'll kind of map through how this might work in practice. So the first element is market risk. And market risk is pretty straightforward. We all have had this beaten to our heads. Um, essentially, higher risk, however one measures that. In this simple example here, I have standard deviation. It it's, tends to be related with extra return. So if you have higher risk assets that move around a lot more, you generally can expect to earn higher returns versus those that have lower risk. Now, of course, there's huge debates on this, but in general, I think this is true at the margin. And this is why stocks earn higher returns than cash under your pillow. Cash under your pillow doesn't move anywhere. You always have it, whereas stocks can have monster 80% plus drawdowns. So people in the marketplace and in equilibrium are generally willing to sell you their stocks knowing full well that you will get this higher return because they get the cash that has no volatility. Um, but the question really is, when we look at empirical evidence, can risk fully explain the story of why some assets are in higher returns than others? And the, the short answer is no, that doesn't seem to be the case. And it's very puzzling. And so a lot of this can be explained, I think, in the in the realm of behavioral finance and specifically in the career risk element of behavioral finance which i'll explain so this also relates to this mispricing concept and before i even talk about uh this very famous paper by andre slyford and robert vishney called uh, limits of arbitrage let's just step back and think about this so why is mispricing hard for the efficient market hype hypothesis people to embrace. Well, it makes sense. If there is a $20 bill on the ground, the common joke with economists is, well, they'll walk by the $20 bill because that cannot exist. There can't be free money lying around. And that seems to be a reasonable assumption because if there's $20 bill on the ground and it's easy to grab, they're generally not going to exist in the marketplace. But 
I propose a different situation. What if there's a $20 bill on the ground and just by random chance, um, there's a grizzly bear that likes the smell of dollar bills. And this grizzly bear you know, sniffs around and he's standing over this $20 bill. And now the economist approaches this $20 bill with the grizzly standing over the top of it. So the $20 bill on the ground is certainly an element of mispricing. We shouldn't see this in the marketplace, but the problem is exploiting this opportunity is very difficult. I have to go fight this grizzly bear, which could kill me before I could get this $20 bill. So prices are not efficient in the sense that $20 bills are actually on the ground, but it's not like it's easy to take advantage of this mispricing because I could get eaten by a grizzly bear. Now, that's a simple example that has really nothing to do with financial markets per se, but it highlights this idea that sometimes arbitrage is actually extremely costly and mispricing is not exactly going to get vanquished just because there's a lot of smart people out there with machine learning algorithms. The way this was exemplified is in this paper, The Limits of Arbitrage by Andre Seifer and uh, Robert Bishop, where they have this hypothetical example where let's say there is a very intelligent investor. Let's say this investor knows everything about the world, both past, present, and future. And we like to call him God. If that's offensive to you, it's not meant to be. It's just to highlight this idea of some, some being that knows everything about everything. And they look at the stock market and they identify that there's a time zero. Now a stock is priced here. However, in the long run, this God individual knows that the stock price is double that. And because they know everything about the future, they are 100% correct. The rational value of the security should be two times what it currently is. However, there's this element of the short run. So the short run element comes into play as follows. In the short run, the stock price could move towards fundamental value. Uh, but it could also get worse before things get better because there's humans involved in the stock market and they sometimes do crazy things. Well, why is this relevant to God? Well, it's relevant to God if God manages other people's money and God is unable to explain exactly why he's so much smarter than everyone else. And therefore, people a lot of times use short-term performance as a proxy for skill. Why is that setup important? Well, in scenario one here, uh, God buys a security and attempt to arbitrage this mispricing and things move as expected. So prices get more rational. They move closer to fundamentals. God tells his investors in the short run, look how smart I am. They probably give them more money. Great. Everyone's happy. But there's another scenario. God looks at this long-term arbitrage and does this investment. But now in the short run, things get a lot worse before they get a lot better. And God explains to his investors when he's dropped half the money, well, just trust me. Don't, don't rely on my past performance. It's my process. I'm telling you, it's perfect because I know everything about the future. You just have to stick with me. And of course, the clients who are unable to really believe God um, essentially say, no way, Jose, give me my money. I'm out of here. We're liquidating you. And of course, eventually it does go to $200, but no one gets to enjoy this uh, because God has been bankrupted in his business. So what this highlights is this aspect of career risk that is associated with trying to exploit long duration arbitrage situations where value and momentum might be a good case study where we know over the long haul, it's hard to deny that these things have not worked. Um, but we also know that the transition in the interim, especially on a relative performance basis, is not pretty. We can go through five year stretches of underperformance, i.e. we're going to get fired. And so as an asset manager, if we know that we could potentially get fired if we get destroyed over a long period on a relative performance basis, we lose our business. So the incentives are to maybe, well, let's not maybe exploit long duration opportunity. Let's closet index or benchmark hug or do things that don't require long duration risk bearing. And instead we can resolve every single second, i.e. proprietary trading or maybe market making. Uh, but we're certainly not going to be Rentech 
and Jim Simons is not going to try to exploit the value anomaly because he could die before he's right. So anyways, that highlights this element of career risk, which I think is ever present in the marketplace. And the best way to exemplify this is we actually looked at data and, and we actually generated this portfolio that cheats. It's, we call it the God portfolio strategy, where we start back almost you know, a little over 90 years. And in 1927, we look ahead five years, identify those securities that have performed the best and those securities that have performed the worst. And we sort these stocks into deciles and we buy these portfolios and we look at the performance over the last 90 some odd years. Not surprisingly, the top decile winners almost earn 30% per year compounded or almost triple the market return over this period. You would essentially be almost a trillionaire if you compounded at 30% for over 90 years. Similarly, down here in the worst bucket, if you own the biggest losers over the next five years well not surprisingly that portfolio strategy is terrible you lose on average over 15 percent compounded per year i.e at the end of five year periods you're essentially bankrupt every time so these results are not surprising if we cheat we can obviously earn really high returns now what is surprising is the risk profile of the god portfolio versus the generic market so just because God is perfect in a long-term investment sense doesn't mean that he does not have to endure fundamental risk and that sentiment can't throw a lot of his securities out with everyone else. So if we look at the drawdown profile of the God strategy in the dark kind of purplish blue relative to the S&P, which is in pink, we notice that God has to endure many of the same gut-wrenching drawdowns as everyone else who invests in the market. And this I find highly, highly fascinating and was definitely not my null hypothesis when we examine this so-called God portfolio. I assume if you're buying the perfect stocks, you're probably not going to have a lot of risk in the form of drawdown. That is actually 100% incorrect. Your drawdown profile is essentially the same as the market, i.e. market prices probably don't always reflect fundamentals of cash flows, and they tend to be much more volatile than the underlying cash flows, which is actually what Bob Schiller said uh, about 20, 30 years ago and in his seminal research. So don't believe in career risk. Well, let's look at arguably the best value investor of all time, Warren Buffett. And what we'll examine here is a nine month period in the tech bubble or internet bubble. Uh, if you weren't alive during that time, it was fascinating uh, time in the marketplace, great time to actually be involved because you got to live this firsthand. And so what happened with poor Berkshire and Buffett and Charlie Munger? Well, here we have Berkshire happily was down 40%. Meanwhile, the market, which at that time people didn't pay attention to S&P because it was too boring, it was all about the NASDAQ and the triple Qs. That was the market and that was the ticker that was at the top of CNBC at that point, not S&P 500. Whereas nowadays, ironically, S&P 500 is at the top because it's been the best performing asset in the world. But I digress. Long story short, Buffett was off almost 40, 50 points on the S&P but more importantly, he was off 150 points on the tech index, i.e. if he were managing other people's money, he would almost certainly have been liquidated. And the good examples of people where that happened were someone like Julian Robertson, arguably one of the greatest stock pickers of all time, since he went bust in this because he stuck to his guns too strongly. Investors said value is dead. Internet companies will scale, take over the world, prices don't matter, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. A lot of the same language we actually see in the marketplace today. Um, it's certainly not as frothy, but it's you know history is certainly rhyming. It seems. But the long story short here is that sustainable investing requires perspective, because had one stuck to a generic value strategy after the internet bubble, they would have been rewarded with one of the greatest value runs of all time over the next decade. When people ask me the question, well, do these factors work? Like, you know, historically they work, but why the heck would they work out of sample? Because everyone knows about value and momentum and all these other things you academic geeks have been talking about for years. And I like to flip the question and say, 
why would factors which are generally way more risky fundamentally and extraordinarily difficult to exploit not work? Why would you take on all this pain and not be rewarded in some form of gain? That would actually suggest that market are probably not very efficient, which is a, you know, I think a more appropriate question when dealing with factors, uh, especially once we understand the reality of factor investing. Now we can look at, okay, great. We understand, you know, kind of a framework for investing, like you earn excess return because you take on risk and you generally have to do things that aren't pleasant, in, especially in the form of career risk. How does one consider factors in their portfolio considerations? Like how, what, where does construction and what should we be thinking about when we look to this now that we know this framework? There's the framework. You, you need extra risk. You need to do something that's probably not fun. Uh, the secret formula for out of sample expected returns is no pain, no gain. And anyone who tells you different is probably selling you a pipe dream. Reiterate, value and momentum. Perfect example of things that quote unquote work over the long haul, but are incredibly difficult to exploit because they are fundamentally anchored in risk and mispricing that is difficult to exploit. A perfect example of that is value. What do we have here? Well, one has a simple signal. We're going to sort securities on cheapness and we're going to use our favorite metric, which is enterprise multiple. And specifically, we're going to use the operating income over enterprise value. So how much money do we make at this firm? How, like we take our revenues, we take out the cost of goods sold, we take out the selling general and administrative, and we're left with kind of the profitability of this firm before consideration for paying off different debt shareholders or, or what have you. So kind of what do these assets make? And then enterprise value is simply what is the cost of all these assets that generate that operating income. So we're going to use that same signal, but we're going to differ the portfolio construction along two dimensions. First dimension is concentration. Every year we could, if we had a thousand security, for example, we could buy the top 500 cheapest on enterprise multiples. We could also buy the top 200 cheapest, or we could buy the top 50 cheapest. Heck, if we're crazy, we could buy the the top cheapest. That's So that's one dimension of portfolio construction using cheapness. Another dimension of portfolio construction is turnover, frequency of rebalance. We could rebalance the portfolio every month, or we could rebalance it every year. Now, why might this be important? Well, this is kind of a measure of how stale the portfolio is. For example, if we look at uh, rebalance every year, we could go buy securities today and then tomorrow one of these securities could go from being very cheap to being maybe extraordinarily expensive. And maybe what we want to do is sell that extraordinarily expensive firm and plug in the new firm that's, you know, much cheaper, um, i.e. freshness. So we could be super stale and not rebalance too frequently, or we could do it every month. Heck, we could do it every day if we wanted to. But the point of this exercise is just to highlight how expected returns are highly tied to concentration or level of characteristic we focus on and how fast we refresh this characteristic. We're super diluted, super diversified exposures into cheapness that hardly ever turn over aren't much different than the overall market, which makes sense. If you basically look more and more like the market, you're going to act more and more like the market. Whereas if we have a signal, let's say cheapness that we believe in, one would expect that as we concentrate more in this factor and we refresh it more frequently, that we should earn higher expected returns if we believe this thing actually proxies for risk and mispricing. It would actually be very surprising if by doing it more diversified and less frequently rebalanced, that it would work better. This is just an empirical fact. Um, it with value, with momentum, and frankly, with any factor that proxies for risk and or mispricing, we should see this sort of pattern. More concentration, more frequency equals higher expected returns. Now, important to note, this is in a vacuum without consideration for transactions costs. Clearly, there would be a trade-off there, um, but that's beyond the scope of this discussion. This is more just the bottom line things to consider from a portfolio construction perspective. So great, 
I love this value factor. Like, I want to do this. Let's do this super concentrated, you know, high frequency rebounds value factor because that's what generates all these beautiful returns that make our chart, you know, expand well beyond the S&P 500 over the long term. So where do I sign? Well, here's a chart of the Vanguard value ETF in the S&P 500. And we don't have to use a lot of math or quant metrics to simply make the case that these are not very different. This is not the value factor as espoused in academic research or when we look at these top decile portfolios. These are closet indexes. And I always use Vanguard here because Vanguard is very upfront that this is a closet index and we're not trying to market as something different. Like, yes, our value ETF is not the traditional value factor as one would see in academic research. This is a very small dosage of value tilt, but for all intents and purposes, basic S&P 500. And oh, by the way, we're not going to charge you any differentiation in the fees um, because we're acknowledging the fact that this is a closet index. So again, if you go to the marketplace to try to exploit these opportunities, a lot of times the off offerings are going to be very close to a closet index or a benchmark hugger. One, because those houses are being very transparent that that's what they're delivering. Or two, they're not being transparent of what they're delivering and they're actually selling you the factor story, but they're not telling you the site positioning uh, career risk problem that their incentives are to not actually do the real factor because they know they will get fired. And this is why they may not do hardcore, super concentrated, high frequency rebounds, because now we have plotted out tracking error. Tracking error is simply a measure of deviation from the broad index over time. And a closet indexer wants to have very low tracking error because they don't want to deviate strongly from a, a standardized benchmark because as we've discussed earlier, if one deviates very high or very low specifically from a benchmark, it's a great way to lose one's business. So we have a lot of incentives in the asset management industry where we manage other people's money to do no harm in the sense that harm is relative performance to the benchmark. So we would much prefer super diluted, low turnover strategies that approximate the S&P 500 closer than we would to do these maniacal, crazy, concentrated, high turnover strategies because these things are a great way to have a pink slip delivered to our office and lose our job. So there is a very clear trade-off between exploiting expected returns in these so-called open secret factors and taking on career risk or in the form of as simply measured by tracking error. And this really summarizes everything in a very simple uh, University of Chicago highly complex chart that I came up with here where the x-axis is being different and the y-axis is behavioral challenge. And there seems to be a very clear relationship between the amount of differentiation and the amount of behavioral challenge that come with being different. In the end, there is no right answer here. There is simply trade-offs. And if one is very disciplined and very focused and has a great belief in some underlying differentiated process, well, they're willing to take on these behavioral challenges and potentially benefit from their capacity to be so disciplined. However, if one is not very disciplined, if one is very focused on short-term relative performance, then the be potential benefits of being different are going to be overwhelmingly dwarfed by the cost of the behavioral issues, and they may end up being worse off than simply buying a Vanguard fund, which has no differentiation, but is also very cheap and is very easy to hold because it has very little behavioral challenges. This is just a kind of an ironclad rule, it seems, in the marketplace. And so the question is to consider one factor investing and especially when identifying what type of factor investing we're going to do and how we're going to form these portfolios is ask yourself some fundamental questions. Am I actually disciplined or are my clients actually disciplined? Because even if I'm disciplined, but my clients are insane, well, this may not be a great idea or me, we may need to consider different ways to size this factor bet. Do I really have horizon? Is this money 20-year money? Or is this money really 
every quarter we're going to look at how it does relative to the benchmark and if it underperforms we'll take it away if it outperforms we add more um, so a lot of people say they have long-term 20-year horizon money but i think it's probably doubtful that they actually have this horizon and then finally fundamentally do i really believe in this process uh, you know value is a good example Okay, sure. I've been reading every Ben Graham article I've ever written. I've read everything that Warren Buffett ever wrote. I've read every academic paper. I've looked at the 200 years of data that says that buying cheap fundamentally works over the long haul in every country, in every sample, etc. And yes, I know it's painful, but do I really believe? Because if I don't essentially have a faith in this process, inevitably when I hit that five year run of relative underperformance, I will pull my capital. So in, in a weird way, we want to go into factors as evidence-based investors, but at some point, once we've established what we believe is the actual evidence, we need to move from a evidence-based investor to essentially a faith-based, religious-based investor, because that is the only way to behaviorally build ourselves up. So we can stick to this process and potentially exploit um, our capacity to exploit mispricing and uh, take on additional fundamental risk. The final challenge here is how do we manage investor behavior? If we're going to do this active factor investing, we need to sign up for discomfort, period. No pain, no gain is the magic formula. How do I manage it? And so this is something that we don't have a perfect solution to, but these are three genres of ideas that we think the keys may be there to the castle. The first one is trust. So if we are in a third party relationship, it's very important that whoever is operating on our behalf is operating as a fiduciary. So at least we have confidence that their interests or our interests are they being honest about this stuff like yes we're going to do value and yes value sucks sometimes sometimes for 10 years you can underperform are you ready for that if you're in a fiduciary relationship where you're managing other people's money it's very important that that fiduciary tells you this stuff up front it's very important that they have your best interest and it's very important that you trust them because in the end the way you will stick to a process is because you trust this individual and trust has a double-edged sword you could trust someone who's an idiot and they may make you do dumb things that don't work but ideally you can attach trust to someone who presumably knows what they're doing and this can help you stay in your seat if you try to do this factor stuff the other one is just teaching so our firm mission is to empower investors through education in order to build sustainable investors. The reason we are super transparent and super focused on education is, is we're going to help people understand this reality of factors and active investing. You need to take on other risk and you need to do crazy stuff to earn excess return. If you can't accept that reality, then don't do it. But if you're informed and educated about how the market and how the world presumably works, you are more likely to sit in your seat when you've chosen to do a investment and it may be underperforming. Similarly, when it's outperforming by a huge margin, you don't get very emotional and excited. You just say, well, that's an outcome of my process because I was educated and informed about what we were doing in the first place. And all that sort of relates to the third bucket, which is transparency. I think it's very important that when people actively invest, especially with factors, that transparency be insane because that helps the clients or the users of these products understand what's going on and why. So one can use attribution analysis where we can assign different elements of our process and assess that those returns associated with it. Also portfolio transparency. So here's what we own and here's why. And it's part of our algorithm that's trying to exploit this long-term factor edge. But oh, by the way, some of these holdings you might not like. That's why it works. You have to do stuff that's weird. And then also just reiterating all the time the long-term evidence. What are the base rates for these concepts and ideas? In real time, it may be very difficult to own value strategies or momentum strategies or trend follow.
But the hard, cold truth is that these strategies are the most robust open secrets that mankind knows. And they generally work for a reason. They have risk and they have mispricing that's tough to exploit. So as long as we reiterate this story, I think it helps everyone sit in their seat and embrace these behavioral challenges that come with the territory of being a long-term investor. In the end, the secret sauce of long-term outperformance really boils down to two components. And it's really, I should not put a plus here, I should put an and statement here. Because the only way one can achieve long-term success, in our opinion, is you have to have some sort of process that is reasonable and exploits risk and mispricing. But more importantly, we need the client base and the capital source to be sustainable. Because if we deliver a process that is reasonable and loads up on risk and mispricing exploitation, and we couple it with short-term performance chasing investors who are highly concerned about what happens in a relative sense, well, they're going to end up selling out at the exact worst times and buying in at the exact worst time. Similarly, if we have great investors, but we give them an undifferentiated closet indexing process that's no better than the S&P 500, well, that's not going to deliver anything either. We, again, we need to have both of these components in order to achieve what a lot of people call alpha. Um, where alpha is somewhat in the eyes of the beholder, but we'll just define it here as the expected long-term outperformance versus some generic broad index. So again, thank you very much uh, listening. I hope it was informative uh, and we always welcome feedback and always focus on our mission here at Alpha Architect to empower investors for education. And we look forward to talking to you more about investing in the future. The views expressed in this recording are the personal views of the participants as of the date indicated and do not necessarily reflect the views of Alpha Architect itself. Nothing contained in this recording constitutes investment, legal, tax, or other advice and should not be viewed as a current or past recommendation or a solicitation of an offer to buy or sell any securities or to adopt any investment strategy. The information in this recording is based on current market conditions which will fluctuate and may be superseded by subsequent market events or for other reasons. Alpha Architect does not resume any duty to update forward-looking statements. The information in this recording has been developed internally and or obtained from sources believed to be reliable. However, no representation or warranty, express or implied, is made or given by or on behalf of Alpha Architect as to the accuracy and completeness or fairness of the information contained in this recording. Any liability as a result of this recording, including direct, indirect, special, or consequential loss or damage is expressly disclaimed. Copyright 2018, Alpha Architect LLC. All rights reserved.